In the 21st century, those who change the world are those who change the culture. They get people in sync, lead tribes, create movements, and generate an energy field where ordinary people achieve extraordinary results. Amazon is one of the firms we've just studied. Almost everyone I know around the world has bought from Amazon. They own 20% of global internet sales. Why do I, as a customer, go on Amazon to buy, to buy your latest book or my book or whatever? They're fast. They're easy. They're, they're dependable. They're predictable. I'm, I'm on Amazon Prime. I'll get the book within 24 hours. Yes, 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 yes. What do you have to do inside to make that happen? Are you loose or are you tight in terms of decision making? You're very tight. Are you unstructured or structured? You're very structured and very disciplined. Amazon's internal culture in their distribution system, Amazon services, is very structured because that's what gives me the customer what I want most. That's the identity of the firm in the mind of our customers. I want to get from Amazon this product quickly, relevant as quickly as I can, made real to every employee. I hire people, I train people to make that culture real every day. So I'll say it again. For me, culture is the identity of the firm in the mind of our key customers made real to our employees every day. I'm Aga Bayer, and this is the Culture Lab podcast where you will find ideas and inspiration on how to harness the power of team and organizational culture. I talk to leadership thinkers, culture experts, entrepreneurs, and all sorts of movers and shakers. And together we explore the fascinating topic of culture, leadership, and personal growth. If you like what you hear, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Or better yet, write a review on iTunes and share the podcast with your followers and friends on social media. For more, check out our archive at www.agabayer.com slash podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 28. Believe it or not, it's been almost a year since we launched the podcast. And looking back, I have to say that it's been an incredible ride. I got to meet and talk with amazing people who enrich the way I think about culture and about culture evolution. But I also got to interact with a lot of our listeners, and I'm extremely, extremely grateful for these relationships. And the show itself did pretty well as well. Thanks to our listeners, Culture Lab has been listed as one of the top 10 leadership podcasts by Player FM. We've had thousands of listeners from almost 50 countries around the globe, and we grew to become one of the most popular shows on company culture. So if you are a regular listener, here is my heartfelt thank you for coming back every second Tuesday and tuning in. We're truly grateful and honored that you find the podcast interesting because I know that time is our most precious resource and spending an hour on listening to a podcast is a really huge vote of confidence. Um, and if you are new to Culture Lab, then I want to extend my special welcome. I hope you enjoy the show and join others in tuning in every second Tuesday for my interviews with incredible, incredible guests. And don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or anywhere else you get your podcasts. I hope that listening to Culture Lab will inspire you to create your own ripples of change and to contribute to creating awesome workplace cultures. And now let's go to this week's episode. And my guest this week is Dave Ulrich. And if you are vaguely interested in management and HR, I'm sure that you already know Dave and you are familiar with his work. And I'm sure you know you are in for a treat. Dave is considered to be the father of modern HR. He's been ranked as the number one management guru by Business Week. He was profiled by Fast Company as the world's top 10 creative people in business, a top five coach in Forbes, and recognized on Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame as one of the world's leading business thinkers. Dave has a passion for ideas with impact. And when I asked him about the ideas that had most impact, in his opinion, in his 30 plus years of studying business and HR, he mentioned focus on culture as one of the two game-changing ideas that have an impact. 
But this doesn't mean that he thinks that we got the culture piece right yet, though. So listen to what Dave Ulrich has to say about what's wrong with the way we view culture and what's a more effective way to approach it. Here we go. Here is Dave Ulrich. Dave, welcome to Culture Lab. Aga, I am so delighted to be here, and I'm sorry I'm not in Milan wearing a very fancy suit. <laughs> that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? We could sit down. I did a workshop in Milan a few years ago, and it was sponsored by one of the great uh, fashion manufacturers. And I'm a very large person, and they said, you know, we don't have. <laughs> Uh, a male model who's very large and we will <laughs> we will give you a discount on a suit if you will be one of our male models so i uh, <laughs> got one of the very <laughs> fancy milan suit so uh, as uh, as one of the heavy set male models so anyway <laughs> thank you for the privilege of letting me visit with you well, thank you. Thank you. I'm really thrilled. And I think for most of our listeners, you are one of these people who don't need any introductions. Um, and it's it's wonderful to have this opportunity to talk with you about um, a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, which is organizational culture. But before we dive into the topic of organizational culture, I would like to ask you about your personal cultural influences. So what shaped you, Dave? What made Dave, Dave? <laughs> um, I, I would answer that with uh, two Fs, which are not the Fs that people might expect. One is my family, uh, incredible parents and heritage and uh, Lidge of, of service and, and my father worked for the government, uh, retired at age 55, retired early, and then did what he called his uh, bread run. He went to a local grocery stores in his pickup truck and picked up day old fruit and bread and gave it to uh, homeless and women's and other shelters in the city where I grew up. And so uh, dad did that three to four hours every day until he died at age 80. And uh, that ethos of service is just embedded as part of my family and Currently, my uh, my wife and I are very involved with service and try to do some of that, and my mother as well. And the other F is faith. I have a pretty deep and abiding faith in 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 the divinity and purpose of life. And so, family and faith, I think, have been uh, two of the uh, foundational drivers. And so, I'm wondering how does your interest in HR? Um, initially uh, sort of appear in your in your life can you remember the moment in your life when you thought oh this is interesting oh. i want to explore it further yeah it's a it's a it's a great question uh i didn't i don't think many of us grew up saying oh no. when i get old i want to study <laughs> no. hr uh that's not common i uh, i ended up doing a phd in numerical taxonomy Taxonomy is the science of order. Uh, today, people say, oh, analytics is brand new. Analytics is a new research has been going on in this field for decades. Uh, it's now getting more daylight, which is a good thing. Um, and taxonomy, the research I did decades ago was to say, what makes organizations unique? Is it their strategy? Is it their market position? Is it their industry? And I made an argument that the uniqueness was about how they are organized, how they govern, how they get things done, that that is a, a clear definition of uniqueness. And the minute that you begin to define organizational identity less by what business we're in and more by how we operate, the HR issues become center stage. So it's it's how do we build the right culture? How do we manage people? How do we do the HR systems of staffing and performance management and work and information? And so I begin to define organizational uniqueness or a taxonomy of organizations through their internal systems. And that got me into uh, into culture and in HR. The other thing is, so how does an organization win? And that's always my passion is what's the outcome? What's the value we're creating here? And and what I discovered is competitors can copy strategy, whatever color uh, de jour it is, if it's blue or red or purple or pink, we can we can articulate a mission or a vision or a strategy. We can today in this world of, of global financing and kickstart get access to capital. If we have a good idea, we can get money. We can even download <laughs> you and I this morning. The listeners won't be bothered by my hassles of of the latest technology. We can fuss with it and download technology, but it's very difficult to imitate organization and people. 
So on the one hand, they differentiate organizations. And on the other hand, they enable an organization to win in its marketplace because it's a differentiator. So those are the kinds of thinking that got me into the HR business. And when was that, Dave? Was it 30 years ago? Or? That was probably in the uh, early 80s when I was right. doing that research. So. Yeah, so many years have passed since then. Um, and I guess, you know, I'm curious because it's been a long journey. You have been working in this area for so many years. So it's interesting to find out what do you think was the biggest change in, in uh, the area of HR in those past three decades? If you were to name just one thing that you consider changed dramatically. Um, it's hard to name one. I, I have a deep and abiding passion uh, of learning. And so in my work, I try to have, uh, and you would probably appreciate this, having written so much about culture and done such a great job with that area, that I, I like to have about 20 to 25 percent new material every 18 to 24 months. So change is a passion of mine. Um, I see if I were to give two, one, from an internal focus of labor markets inside a company to an external focus. HR is not about people. It's not about what we do inside the company. It's about what we do inside so that we win outside in the marketplace. And that could be with customers. It could be with investors. It could be in the community. So it's it's HR is an internal to an increasingly external agenda. And second, I think HR has been defined for 30 years as people. It's human capital, it's people, it's the labor force, it's the workforce, it's our talent. I think we're now starting to see, and you were part of that movement in a beautiful way, uh, a focus that it's not the people, it's the system, it's the culture, it's the workplace, not the workforce. It's the process, not just the people. Mm -hmm. And so inside to outside, people to process and culture right. becomes an increasingly critical part of, of the HR agenda. Mm. Yeah. And so... Thinking about the system and an effective organization, what would you say are the three biggest challenges that leaders face today uh, in building that effective system and effective organization? Um, <laughs> great question. You've really done your homework well. Um, I'm going to give two. One is defining the organization not as morphology or structure. It's not about the roles. It's not about the position. It's not about who reports to whom. But it's about capability. It's about what are we good at doing? And and so in Milan, in a fashion company, what is it we're good at doing? It's and People, customers don't care about who reports to whom as much as they care that you're quick to market, that you're good at moving mm -hmm. quickly, that you're that you're fashionable, that, that you have the latest fashion, that you have innovation, that you have collaboration with them. And so it's it's defining organization as capability. And culture is one of those key capabilities. And the second one for me that I think is so critical is that you have to get the right culture. Um, it's in, in, and that's why this outside in movement is so important to me that to say, yes, every organization has a culture. We, we see it. But for an organization to win, it's not just a culture. It's the right culture. And how do we begin to articulate what the right culture might be? Yeah, and, and I, I've heard you speak about um, the fact that culture matters, but the right culture matters more. So could you talk to us a little bit about what is the right culture? Absolutely. Um, walk into any company. Uh, I've understood that Hilton has some of the best executives of any in the industry. They have men and women <laughs> who are just brilliant. Um, and within a few moments of walking into a Hilton hotel or a Marriott or or a Hyatt, I can feel something as a customer. Is what I feel going to get me to come back? Is it going to get me to renew? Is it going to get me to stay? And, and, and so it isn't a culture. And by the way, I think this is an evolution of culture thinking, just like HR. It isn't about hiring people. It's about hiring people who are the right people. It isn't about paying people. It's about paying people to do the things that will help us win. And the right people, the right payment should be the things that help us win in the marketplace. And so our work on culture is not that it's, um, and I know I'm going to get into some controversial things. You've already warned me about that. I think culture's legacy and HR's legacy was inside the firm. So what do I feel? What is Hilton's set of values? What are our norms? Culture is the roots of the tree. It's our anchors. It's our values. I think that's an old definition of HR. 
And I think it's an old definition of culture. I think culture is the leaves of the tree. It's where we're going. It's where we're headed. Um, I think talent is not about who we hire, but are we hiring people who will give customers the experience they value? And when we do that, we get the right culture. Um, mm -hmm. When I go to Disney, they're very serious about giving me a great guest experience. Well, that means they hire a certain set of people at a Disney theme park in Paris or in Japan or in the U.S. who will give me as a customer or a guest at Disney that experience. And, and I get really worried when the culture work is simply mm -hmm. a generic culture because I think generic brands don't, don't win over time. That a culture should be the identity of the firm in the mind of our best customer. And that's the logic we've been trying to uh, pivot to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and you also talk about the value of values where basically what you're saying is ask your customers whether it's important for them equally as it is important for you, which I think sometimes can challenge the identity of the organization. Because if you've been living with a certain value for 20 years, and then suddenly you realize that your customers are not that interested in that particular thing. What you are saying, Dave, is that perhaps you should consider reinventing yourself so that you can service and give your customers the best possible service or the best possible products so that, as you say, they, you can win in the market. I should tape this and record it. And you, you described it so beautifully. Uh, and and let me let me ask you a question. You obviously travel a lot, and I don't know your travel habits at all. But do you do you do uh, carry on bags? I yeah, I do. Yeah, I do too. Because I don't have time to check when I'm doing yeah. a lot of flights. Um, when you show up at a hotel, let's just do a hypothetical. You've flown from Europe to Dubai or or to Africa. You've had a 12-hour flight. You're tired. It's 1 a.m. in the morning. You have to speak in five hours. And a bailman comes out as your, as your driver or cab brings you to a very nice hotel, probably a Hilton. Um, and I'm trying to advertise Hilton through this discussion. Um, but but um, And he opens the trunk of your cab and he grabs your suitcase and he says, ma'am, or to me, sir, I'm going to give you great service. And he walks away with your bag. Mm -hmm. Now. Here's the issue. Service is a value. It's a good value. But service is not defined by the hotel. It's defined by the receiver. I frankly mm -hmm. don't want him to take my bag because I, I'm really tired. I don't want to wait 15 minutes to get the bag to my room. I may not have dirham or the, or the local yeah. currency, whatever it is. Uh, to give them a tip. I just I just want to get to my bed as fast as I can. Service, mm -hmm. and I don't know where you are. I don't know if you enjoy somebody who carries your bags or if you just as well carry them yourself. But well, actually, I'm 100% with you on that one, and particularly at 1 a.m. at night. You definitely don't want to be waiting for your bag because usually they don't come immediately. So you are in the room first, and then the person with your bag arrives after 15 minutes or something like that. And that's not a yeah. great scenario. And, and I may not have AED, I may not have change. And anyway, so, the, but the message of that simple anecdote, and I hope some of our readers appreciate that, is that value is defined by the receiver, not the giver. This well-intended bailman is trying to give me service, but he hasn't asked me what service means to me. And so that for us is a concept of the value of values. If you go to your customer and say, do you value service? Of course, I value service. What does that mean to you? And then to begin to build service or culture or values against that expectation. Um, what does innovation mean to you? Uh, what does collaboration mean to you? What was uh, what does what does good employee? What would a good employee look like to you? Now, the second thing you did in your answer, and you did it so beautifully, and I hope I got this right. You used two words, so that, and I really love those two words because they take what's inside me. I want to give good service so that, and the so that makes that an outcome that somebody else will value. Just, and, and I really love that you use those words. Um, at, at the University of Michigan, where I teach, uh, people come and we say, what would you like to learn in this uh, two-week program? I'd like to learn more about executive compensation. I'd like to learn more about career planning or, or uh, talent review or changing a culture. And they post it on the wall. I come in the second day and I say, that's really interesting, 
but for me, it's not complete. Could you go back to the flip chart you posted? I want to learn more about culture, careers, or succession planning, or leadership development. Right behind what you wrote, two words, so that. I want to learn more about leadership, so that. I want to learn more about culture, so that. And the answer to the so that, I believe, should be outside the company. How will you connect what you do with culture or leadership or career or executive comp to the customer, to the investor, to the community? And it could also be inside the employee. I want to look about culture so that our employees experience a better well-being. But but unless there's a so that, the activity becomes uh, somewhat isolating. And and for example, and I'm babbling too much. You just you just did a dangerous thing. You said, "Tell me what you're interested in," and I'm just babbling. Aga, I'm really sorry, but um, <laughs> you know, it's until you can get that outcome, that so that the event becomes isolated. When we get a so that, then the activity becomes connected to a receiver who we care about, and. And I think that's what we're trying to do with culture. It's not just values. It's the value of value so that somebody else gets benefit. In the strengths movement, there was a big movement on build on your strengths, build on your strengths. Great set of ideas. Who can disagree? It's wonderful to have strengths. But unless the strengths strengthen someone else so that your strengths will benefit somebody, they become an isolated activity. Um, and it, and it's that, so that leadership be authentic. Well, who disagrees? I, I don't want leaders who are inauthentic, but leadership authenticity that doesn't help somebody else is what we call narcissism. I'm, you know, I'm really authentic. I tweet every morning at 5 AM what I think. Well, unless you're creating value for somebody else, that's not good leadership. That's narcissism. And, and the same is true of culture. Now, I'll come back to where you are, you are clearly the expert. Culture is not about the roots of the tree and the values. It's how values will create value for somebody else. Okay, I've just babbled, and I'm really sorry. I just love what you said. Oh, this, this is an absolutely wonderful explanation of what the value of values is and also what organizations might need to do. Uh, in order to clarify what their customers expect from them. And I'm wondering, do you have any examples of companies who have done that really well? Because I think, you know, when you think about, okay, so we need to go to our customers now and find out what do they want in terms of service or what great service looks like to them. Um, you really need to have a very good understanding, A, who is our ideal client? Who are they? And then have access to them and be able to ask them the questions in a way that you can make sense out of it. Um, so do you, do you have any examples how organizations did that and what it did for them? You bet. And, and I could ask you, are there companies you admire? And I think the companies that win and sustain winning are constantly asking that question. I've used one, I've used two examples and I'll use them. One is Disney is constantly, I'll use three examples real quick, constantly asking who are the guests? What are the experiences? So at a, at a broad, broad level, Disney starts with Mickey Mouse giving children a cartoon and Goofy and, and some of the seven dwarves. Then they realize that they're in the entertainment business. Their customers are not just children, but also adults. So they open an Epcot Center. And then they realize that entertainment is not just a physical place where you, where you go in Paris or Tokyo or the U.S., but it's also entertainment through cruises. So the Disney gets into the cruise business. It's entertainment through uh, movies and distribution. So Disney gets into the television business and the arts business. And, and they're constantly saying, who are the customers, as you say so well, not just children, but adults. What business are we in? We're in the business of, of entertainment. How do we then create value for those stakeholders in a way that's consistent with our values? So I don't think you'd ever see Disney making a, um, a movie that is, I don't know the right word for it, that would be appropriate, but an inappropriate movie that's outside their value scope. You wouldn't yeah. see them doing that. Um, and so Disney continues to do that. The Hilton Hotel has done a beautiful job with that. Um, they were founded, I think, if I remember right, about 1920. And, and they've continued to evolve as their customers have evolved. One that we all get comfortable with, and I'm not sure if it's as prevalent in Europe as the U.S., um, a restaurant chain, Kentucky Fried Chicken. 
Well, let's focus on fried food. Well, here's an insight. People other than me, perhaps, are eating less fried food. Um, and so they changed their name, KFC, because they're trying to respond to those market evolutions and, and building a value set inside that is consistent with those external expectations. That's, that's a really important point, I think, to underscore, because it sounds like really working on your culture is a never ending process because of course our customers change, the context changes. So you can never say, oh, okay, now we've got it right. And it's just about maintaining it. Um, as you say, nutrition and what we believe good nutrition is has changed. And therefore those organizations, they need to catch up with the new trends and make sure that they are still relevant. Absolutely. Right? And so if I remember right at Hilton, and I'm stretching a little bit here, they have a value of hospitality. Well, hospitality mm-hmm. has evolved. We, we have different expectations and, and, and food, the one you give, it, nutrition, it, it used to be fast food. Now it's changing. McDonald's is doing an incredible job um, trying to shape that guest experience so that, so that people will come back. They, uh, they now do more uh, sales in their drive through than they do in their in-store they're now uh, building collaboration with Uber or whatever service you have in your country with Lyft or Didi in China, where they'll distribute mm-hmm. food to you. They're, they're trying to use technology that you can order food through your app. Well, as those customers yeah. change and their experiences are changing, then the, then the company has to change that culture to adapt. That's one of the dangers I see with the the traditional definition of culture and HR as the roots of the tree, as the internal focus, because roots get locked in, mm-hmm. but the leaves grow, they change, they flourish. Yeah. And, and each season you get a new mm-hmm. set of leaves. And, and, and when we think about building the right culture uh, against customer and investor and community expectations, then we're constantly reinventing ourselves as our customer expectations change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I know, Dave, that you and your colleagues have carried out seven HR competency studies over the course of three decades. And as a result of that, you've identified nine competencies for HR leaders. And one of them, of course, not surprisingly, is culture and change champion. Um, So I wanted to ask, how exactly do you see the role of HR specifically in cultivating a constructive culture or what you call the right culture? My goodness, I am surprised with the homework you've done. I I thank your diligence, Saga. Um, I think HR, well, it's funny, I've been posting on LinkedIn every Tuesday for about a year now and trying to, to find a way to distribute ideas with impact. Uh, one of the posts, and I don't get as many views as you would or as others, but it got a 500,000 views, which was amazing. And this was a post um, exam question. Who has primary accountability and responsibility for the HR issues of talent, leadership and culture in a company? Who has primary accountability and responsibility? A business leader, B HR, C it shared, D the consultant, or E, I don't care, I'm going into finance. It was one of my favorite questions. And, um, and, and my, almost everybody answered C, it shared, HR and line manager. I marked it wrong. I think the primary accountability for HR is A, the line manager. I, I, now, I don't want to dump everything to line managers. That's not fair. But line managers are ultimately responsible and accountable for a culture uh, because their behavior should model it. Um, now, what does HR bring to that discussion? Two things. I think those of us in HR are the architects. Um, I don't know if you've ever had the chance to build a house with an architect. We've had that opportunity once. Um, and it was really interesting. The architect would say, Dave and Wendy, and we've been married 40 years. How do you live? Do you want open spaces, closed spaces? Uh, this house we built a long time ago when we had children at home. And we said, in fact, our son talked about it this weekend with us. He said, dad, our house in Michigan, where we had an architect was very different. I said, how's that? And he said, well, upstairs was your bedroom and an office and an exercise room. And then in the basement was three bedrooms for each of me and my two sisters, our si- my siblings. And I said, yeah, that's how we designed it. We wanted maximum separation between parents upstairs and children in the basement. Well, architects give you a blueprint for your ideas. They turn ideas into action. 
And I think in HR, we're the architects of, 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 ta- of culture and, and, and where we want to be known for. The other thing we are is the anthropologist. I, I love the metaphor of anthropology because what an anthropologist does is they observe. They see what's going on and they begin to observe patterns. And I think in HR, we become the observers of patterns that will help us win in the marketplace. So I come into a business leader and I say, KFC, for example, we, we use that one. You know, I'm seeing some data here. And this is where analytics becomes so helpful. Um, greasy, unhealthy food is being redefined and it's being an increasing criteria or uh, McDonald's right now. I see that 94% of millennials have smartphones. They're using smartphones and apps to govern their lives. We should be letting them order food through the smartphone technology. And HR becomes the anthropologist who begins to observe some of those pieces and information in the environment and brings that insight back into the company. Right. Um, so as you say, yeah, the person who's accountable for that is the line manager. The CEO um, in, in the organization is the ultimate um, uh, the ultimate owner or probably responsible, yeah, the person responsible for culture. Um, so why do you think it happens that so many leaders are so reluctant to intentionally invest in shaping their culture? That's a great question. You know, you do some great work on culture. I've read through some of your blogs and your posts and glanced at, at least online, what I could see about your book. What would you say to that? I have an answer, but I'd love to learn from you. What would you say? Why are CEOs reluctant? Well, I think I think one of the reasons is fear, and uh, it's fear of not exactly understanding how culture works and therefore perhaps making some mistakes or finding out that they have an impact on culture that is not entirely desirable. Um, And another thing is that I think there is this misunderstanding that um, other things are more important. So I think with some leaders, what I experience is that they feel they don't have time for that stuff. And that's why they have HR to do those things. Um, and and I think we need to shift the conversation so that it becomes more clear than actually there's nothing probably more important than culture because it's the most powerful force that shapes things in, inside their organization. I think sometimes fear of the unknown creates hesitancy. And, and sometimes I think in HR, we come in with, and you have not done this, you've done this beautifully, with kind of abstract views of cultures. Culture represents the institutional antecedents of our shared cognitions that will shape our fundamental values for the future. Would you like to talk about that? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and I think our, our ambiguous and fuzzy internal definitions scare people. I love your method, your term fear. I think if you come in and say to a CEO, culture is the identity of our firm in the mind of our customer. Are we shaping an internal way we work, if you don't like the word culture, consistent with what we promise our customers? And if you do that, we hope we win. And I really like that. The other Mm -hmm. side I've seen with some CEOs is sometimes it means they have to change. Um, I think when we CEOs stumble, when we see CEOs stumble, I can't say that very well in English. You should say that in Polish. When we see CEOs stumble. they stumble because they don't recognize the impact of their culture. Their, their behavior is like a megaphone that magnifies everywhere. Uber, the CEO and founder of Uber started behaving badly. Um, workforce hostility, displacement of people, treating people with a lack of mm. respect. You know, somebody, I think in HR as an architect should have said, that's not the right way to build this house. Your behavior is going to create problems in the marketplace. And in fact, at Uber, they, they never ended up going public at the time, but the estimate was they were worth the estimate was that they were worth about 50 billion US dollars. After his behavior became public in a social media way, it's very transparent. The stock dropped, or the estimated market value dropped to about 30 billion. And if I'm in HR, I sit down with him and I say, do you realize the risk of your bad behavior yeah. is $20 billion, not only you, but all those who might get benefits from this asset. 
I've got to help you change that. And, and I think some CEOs are not aware of the magnitude of mm-hmm. their impact and, and how it shapes that yeah. confidence in the marketplace. So I, I, having said all that, my experience, and I hope yours as well, is that when culture is articulated in the right way as a way to win in the marketplace, when it's, when it's defined not as an abstract set of institutional antecedents of shared cognitions, but as a set of very clear principles and values that create value for others, I have found most CEOs go, oh, I got it. What do we need to do next? And that's where they turn to you. And I hope any listeners to the show will recognize your, 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 some of the stories you've told in your blogs and your books are just gifted stories about how that can begin to happen. And then I hope they turn to HR people who become the architect of creating some of that culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that you talk um, about is how can HR people um, earn their seat at the table uh, because in order for the CEO to turn to HR for help around culture, um, they need to have a certain credibility and probably needs to, ha- to have won some trust. So do you have any good advice to HR people listening at the moment, what they should be doing to be a trusted advisor of the CEO as far as culture is concerned? Uh, again, great question. Thank you for your homework. As you said, we've done seven waves of study of competencies of HR people. But but what we're interested in, and it's a theme in my work, is not the competence, but it's the competence, as you beautifully said twice, so that we get a set of outcomes. Well, we said there's three outcomes that HR wants to Personally, if I'm an HR professional, I want to create one is I want the ability to build, uh, to gain access, to be at the table was the metaphor 15 years ago, because I'm I'm not at the table. I'm not in the dialogue. I'm not going to have any impact. So what we found is to gain access, to gain, uh, to be a part of the business dialogue, you have to be a credible activist. Two, two pieces, credible, do what you say, um, be respected, have integrity, build trust, be available, be predictable, be dependable. Activist, have a point of view. Don't just wait to mm-hmm. be told, but take a position, have a, have a perspective. Mm-hmm. So getting invited to the discussion as an HR professional requires credible activism. Have a point of view. Be, dis- be, be respected, be a part of the dialogue. Once you're at the table, we said, we found then if the stakeholder you want to serve is the business, the customer, the investor, um, the community, the, the, the essential stakeholders that make a business go, credible activist doesn't get you there. So we're sitting at a, in a business meeting and we're saying we want to grow at the Hilton through innovation in our technology. Uh, because if that's what Hilton's trying to do to give better hospitality, HR s- says, um, what can I do? Listen to me because you trust me. No, that's not good enough. Here's what we should do because I can become a strategic positioner. And that's the second skill set. A strategic positioner can say at the Hilton to get the technology to win against Airbnb or VRBO or some of these emerging lodging industries or hospitality industries, here's what we need to do to win. And now that I'm in the room, my credibility is not the issue. My strategic positioning is. And then the third outcome is delivering business results. Now that we've positioned ourselves to win, what have we got to do? And here's what we found that was really surprising in the seventh round of research. I've got to navigate paradox. Paradox is, should we be long-term or short-term? Mm. Yes. Should we be top-down or bottom-up? Yes. Should we focus on people or teams? Yes. Uh, should we be decisive or inclusive? Yes. And the navigation of paradox is to know how to manage inherent tension so that we get better results. And what we found is good HR professionals are credible activists to get invited in, strategic positioners to help serve customers and investors and paradox navigators to help deliver business results. That's what our uh, data found. That's wonderful. And I think that's, you know, navigating that paradox is also focusing at the same time internally and externally. Ah, great. Um, That's great. I completely agree that HR for decades had 
more of an internal focus, which I don't think necessarily is a bad thing as long as, as you say, it focuses and it's capable of seeing what's happening on the outside of the organization as well. Very well said. I mean, um, and in fact, it's interesting. I got into a discussion online this week and I'm in the middle of editing a, a book that we're putting out hopefully in the next few months. And, and, and one of the, uh, the discussions is should HR focus on employees or customers? And the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. if you don't, yeah. and, and the argument was HR, you know, employ first, if you don't treat your employees well, you're in trouble. My counter argument is if there's no customer, the worst thing you can do to any employee is not win in the market because then there's no organization. And if you don't win in the marketplace, there's no organization. Now, the beauty, as you just beautifully said, is there's a virtuous cycle. If our employees are the employees our customers would choose and our customers respect our employees, then the two become mutually reinforcing and we win in both places. Mm -hmm. That for me is, is where I hope in HR and in business we can begin to head. Yeah. Wonderful. Dave, um, that's really, um, really, really stimulating discussion. I'm sure that our listeners are going to get uh, a lot of value out of it. Um, we have a set of questions that we ask everyone. I call it rapid fire questions. Before I do that, may I ask, may I ask you a, a question? Sure. You have, you have listened and your, your podcast and your shows are so good. What I am really passionate about, if I'm going to have 20 to 25 percent new material every year and a half, mm -hmm. what are some issues, quote, out there that you see floating in this organization or culture space that you say, boy, I hope we can get thought leaders and you talk to more thought leaders than, than, than I ever get to see. What do I hope we begin to get new ideas around? Are there, and I'm hitting you cold with this, obviously, but are there some areas in the world in which we live that we should get some creative solutions that we we just need to discover yeah. together? Totally, I do, yes. And this is one of the areas, actually number one, I think for me is one of the areas that I feel very passionate about because, you know, there are those elements of first, we need to understand our clients, as you say, our market, what it will take to, to win in the market. So I'm completely with you on those things. And I think that in many organizations, there is really good understanding of that already. And many organizations understand that culture is absolutely necessary to win in the market. Um, where we have problems is that A, organizations are not very good at really understanding their culture. And um, I think more work needs to be done there. And it's about perhaps having better tools to assess culture. And as you say, more people in the organization who have those capabilities of being an anthropologist within the organization to really understand what's going on. Um, and it's this ability to talk about what is the ideal culture that will take us where we want to go. But for me, the number one issue is um, if we identify that we need to change this specific thing um, in our culture, we need to involve it, then how do we do that? I think that it's still the how do we do that so that it's sustainable. It's still a very hard thing to do. Um, and, you know, a lot of organizations have assessed culture, have talked about what we need, have identified those areas that need to change. But in terms of actually changing them and sustaining that and maintaining that change, I think this is one of the weaknesses that we definitely need to improve on. I, uh, boy, that's really helpful because you've reinforced um, one of the early books, and I've done a lot of books that I did with Arthur Young, and he and I have a new book coming out. So it's fun to have somebody over 30 years I write with. We talked yeah. about learning organizations as, and here's the tagline, ideas with impact. Mm -hmm. Most of my career, I have put ideas in bold print. I love ideas. I love that fifth, that 20 to 25% new stuff. I love new ideas. I love redefining and reshaping. And impact was kind of in small print. In the last few months, I begin almost to shift that, that ideas through what you've done in your presentations on YouTube and, and through TED Talks and blogs, we can find ideas. The challenge is the impact is now in large caps and bold print. And, and that's what I hear you saying. We, we sort of get 
yes. the idea of culture, culture, each strategy mm-hmm. for lunch or breakfast. That's by the way, it's always funny. That's attributed to Peter Drucker, but I can never, I never could find where he said it. I know. And so my, ta- my <laughs> takeaway is if you have a great quote, tell the world that Peter Drucker said it because then everybody quotes it all over. <laughs> but, but I think if you have ideas in small cap in small print and impact in big print, that's the challenge. That's one of the mm-hmm. challenges. And I really appreciate your, your, your sharing that. That's really helpful. Okay. I will get mm-hmm. to your questions. I don't want to belabor that, but thank you. You, uh, you've, you've reinforced and taught uh, me you. today. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Okay, so let's go to the rapid fire questions. Um, Some of them we addressed partially, but maybe not entirely. So the first one is, how do you define organizational culture? Uh, Culture for me, and I'll say it quickly and give an example. Culture is the identity of the firm in the mind of our key customers made real to our employees every day. So culture is not values, norms, patterns, behaviors, inside the company, it's an identity of the firm in the mind of our key customers made real to our employees every day. So Amazon is one of the firms we've just studied. Almost Mm -hmm. everyone I know around the world has bought from Amazon. They own 20% of global internet sales. Why do I as a customer go on Amazon to buy, to buy your latest book or my book or whatever? They're fast. Mm -hmm. They're easy. They're they're dependable. They're predictable. I'm, I'm on Amazon Prime. I'll get the book within 24 hours. Yes, 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 yes. What do you have to do yeah. inside to make that happen? Are you loose or are you tight in terms of decision making? You're very tight. Are you unstructured or structured? You're very structured and very disciplined. Amazon's internal culture in their distribution system Amazon services is very structured because that's what gives me the customer what I want most. That's the identity of the firm in the mind of our customers. I want to get from Amazon this product quickly, relevant as quickly as I can, made real to every employee. I hire people, I train people to make that culture real every day. So I'll say it again. For me, culture is the identity of the firm in the mind of our key customers, made real to our employees every day. I love that. I love the made real part a lot. It's, it's fantastic. Thank you. And what is the sign or perhaps signs that a company culture needs some work or perhaps even a major overhaul? Great, great rapid fire question. What's happening to our identity in the marketplace? Toys R Us, an a U.S. firm that I think had a global footprint. We started to miss what children were buying, uh, both the distribution system going to a retail space and the products. They're not just buying stuffed bears, they're buying technology. I think when we begin to miss the evolution in the customer, or you use the word client experience, we then begin to miss what our internal culture should be. So I think the early indicators are, are we beginning to see the, what's been called by others smarter than me, the lighthouse customers, the the targeted customers, are they starting to go elsewhere? Uh, people are starting to go to fresh food places mm-hmm. instead of instead of KFC or instead of McDonald's. So you begin to get a sense of what's happening in the marketplace that our internal culture needs to respond to. Mm-hmm. And what are the companies that we, that you admire for their culture and why? Um, again, it's always difficult to name a company because sometimes the things that got us there won't get us there. That's Marshall Goldsmith's great book. We get so excited about our culture that they become roots and they don't become leaves that grow. Um, and so as soon as you name a company, the, uh, the old in search of excellence work named 42 companies and only 13 evolved. Uh, Disney seems to have a knack. We've talked about them uh, of constantly evolving and changing right now, by the way, everybody's Gaga in China about Tencent and Alibaba and higher and Huawei and Supercell and Didi. And in the U S it's Amazon and Apple and Facebook and, and, and Google. Um, my fear is those are newer companies. I admire companies who have continually reinvented themselves and are constantly changing their internal culture to anticipate their external promises. 3M seems to have done some of that. Mm. They move from a manufacturing mining industry and they're they're constantly trying to evolve that culture. Disney seems to have done that as they shift businesses. 
Um, mm-hmm. Some of the lodging industry, you, you talked about hospitality where you have deep roots. Um, they're starting to do that. They're, they're realizing that Airbnb and VRBO and some of the other lodging are changing. They're starting to reinvent some of that culture. Um, I think Apple's shows that they've done that quite well, that Apple has moved from from a culture of, of, of a Mac, the machine, to a software culture, to a retail culture. And, and it's the companies that have the capacity to reinvent that, that seem to be the ones that are exciting to me. And then the question is, how do you build the organizational systems to enable that reinvention? But that may be a whole nother discussion that we can have someday. By the way, if you were to pick two or three companies, uh, again, I, I'd love to learn from uh, thoughtful people. W- who would you pick? Well, you know, s- some organizations, uh, they are sort of easy, um, easy guesses because uh, everyone admires them. And I think you mentioned some of them. Um, so, yeah, I agree. It's, it's quite impressive how those companies have been able to reinvent themselves continuously. And then I have some smaller companies and I'm not even sure if I can, if I can yeah, say the fine. names on the podcast because I would probably have to ask them, but organizations that I know personally, um, various sizes, but they are doing incredible things and are very, very successful in terms of the business, um, which are maybe not that well known or not that sexy. One of the organizations that I would add to the list that I know that they wouldn't have a problem is WD40. It's a great great example of an organization that hasn't actually evolved in terms of the product. So that's an interesting case study as well, because they have this, they have had the same product for decades and yet have been able to be a leader in the market with the same product and they have an amazing culture. People love working there. Um, So yeah, so I, I do admire them. I hope you've interviewed, and I think you have, uh, Gary Abich, who is just brilliant. I have. We, yeah, we haven't released it yet, but yeah. He, he does a brilliant job. Another company of that same size is Gore-Tex, um, who's done a mm-hmm. wonderful job. I mean, they're out there. Some of them don't advertise, um, but, but, but yeah. the companies that do it are continually reinventing, outward facing who they are and what they do. And uh, it's exciting to see. Yes, yes, it's true. Dave, what books on culture should our listeners read? <laughs> Your work, obviously. Uh, you know, it's really interesting. I've written 30 books. The last book, one of the last books we did was called Victory Through Organization. And yeah. and in there we found, and it was amazing with a huge data set of 30,000 people, the organizational stuff, including culture, had four times the impact on business results than the individual stuff. So its culture mm-hmm. capability had more impact than yeah. competence and talent. Um, and that's one that you might want to look at. I've just given you the solution. Um, I yes. love to follow authors. And so it's hard to mm-hmm. say one book. I really like work by Linda Gratton out of the London Business School. I think Linda is a very thoughtful observer of the world, as she would hate it if I defined her as an anthropologist, but I say that with great affection and respect. I really enjoy work by Jeffrey Pfeffer. Uh, he's a professor at Stanford who uh, I think has just uh, – I, anyway, I, I stand at the base of his IQ points. I mean, just a brilliant, brilliant scholar like Linda who can, who can see outside the box. Also at Stanford is Charles O'Reilly, who uh, has not published as much popular work, but his research is exceptional. At Southern California, Mm -hmm. Ed Lawler um, is, I think, one of the godfathers of this field. He's done 50 books and continues to be a model of reinvention. He's just done a book on agile corporation. Um, Oh, Mm -hmm. boy, as soon as I start listing people, I get in trouble. I, uh, I also read everything I can by Ram Charan. Uh, I think one of the, the legacy, and again, these are men and women, Linda and Ram, who, who don't have one book that they publish 10 times. They, they are constantly modeling the reinvention process. Yeah. And those would be some yeah. of the, the people I would That's follow important. perhaps more than mm-hmm. their books. Thank you. That's fantastic. And we're going to post the links to their books uh, or papers in the show notes. Thank you, Dave. So one last question uh, of this series is, what is one thing, one practical thing that our listeners can do tomorrow to build their own culture lab and start cultivating a culture that helps them and their teams win in the marketplace? 
I would, if I were as an individual, I would be asking the so that question that you raised. How does what I'm doing today create value? So today I'm going to go to this meeting. We're going to have this discussion. I'm going to work on this report. I'm going to work on this analytics. So that, so that. And how can I begin mm-hmm. to create a line of sight between what I think, what I feel, and what I do so that customers will be benefited? And, and, and every day there may not be a quick answer. I'm not naive about that. But at least probing that, what's the outcome? What's the value I'm creating for somebody else? I think gets people into the right mindset. Yeah, and so it's so important because sometimes, uh, well, actually quite often, we don't ask ourselves these questions and people tend to have extremely busy days. And, you know, at the end of the day, they look back at what they did and ask themselves, you know, what what was of value? And very often the answer is, "Mm, I'm not so sure. (laughs) So it's, it's a fantastic advice. Just checking in with yourself is what I'm doing at the moment, really adding value somewhere, or am I just going through the motions and perhaps I should be doing something else? Um, so Dave, uh, would you, would you recommend someone, um, that I should interview who has interesting things to say about culture, leadership? You know, I just named a few people. I, uh, yeah. uh, if you haven't talked to Jeff Pfeffer, I just think Jeff is brilliant. Um, mm-hmm. I'll add another person, uh, Steve Kerr, um, mm-hmm. and, and worked at General Electric under Jack Welch, who I think created a culture change and a transformation did the same at Goldman Sachs is uh, is mm-hmm. one of those um, anthropologist architects who's just absolutely brilliant at, at thinking about those issues um, yeah. and and again Linda Ed uh, the list goes on Gary Hamill's the other person if if you haven't talked to Gary Gary just has a knack of uh, of seeing what's out there and what's next fantastic so finally um you know, what thoughts would you like to leave our listeners with in in wrapping up? You know, one of the, I have two passions and I hope one came out today. One is to continue to learn. The other is to create value. And so I hope as you listen to this discussion or as you listen to yourself having discussions, how am I helping someone else today? Um, good leadership is not just about who I am and my authenticity and my, my values. It's what am I doing to be a benefit to somebody else? And, and I hope in this discussion, what we've discussed will help you. Uh, I, my wife of 40 years sometimes says, well, how did your session go today? I don't know. I mean, you've, you've got to listen values defined by the receiver. Did, did people hear or get something that will help them create more value in their lives for somebody else. And Aga, you've done that for me today. You've given me two or three really thoughtful ideas and and asked some very probing questions. But to me, that's what I hope the listeners will uh, walk away with. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And definitely, um, I've uh, learned a lot from you as well. And I think for us to find out whether our listeners have found this useful, you can connect with us, both Dave and I, we're on LinkedIn and Twitter. So you can send us a note, tell us what you found interesting, if you have any questions. I know that you are quite active on LinkedIn as well. So I've seen you having conversations with people. So I'm sure that you can reach out to Dave and and he'll be happy to um, answer there any questions thank that you, you have um so thank you very much again what are other places where people could uh, find you and learn more about your work well first of all before we end our listeners don't appreciate that i'm a technological luddite um and so getting set up uh, you are very patient with me and let me express an appreciation that your listeners don't appreciate so my apologies for my being frustrated at my incapacity and i acknowledge okay. that so I'm Absolutely self-aware of that. No so thank you. No, we have none some of our listeners, listeners, but we uh, that will be them. invisible to <laughs> listeners. But just uh, if you need technology, call Aga. Don't call me. Um, <laughs> and I apologize to you for being a little bit frustrated with that. Um, I hope to be accessible through uh, rbl.net, uh, uh, our website. Uh, LinkedIn is a good place, or I'll even put out my email. It's my initials D O U at umich, U-M-I-C-H dot E-D-U, D-O-U at umich, like University of Michigan dot E-D-U. I love ideas. I love dialogue. Um, and if I'm going to continue to learn, 
20 to 25 percent new material every year and a half. I've got to keep fresh. And so what I really love and I, I really appreciated your comments around impact more than ideas. Um, I keep thinking about that because I keep thinking I get lured into TED Talks. Oh, this is a great TED Talk. I get all excited. And then I realize the half-life of a TED Talk is, is, is the next TV commercial. I mean, it's, it's, it's not an impact. And, and while they're seductive, in fact, in, in the HR field, disrupt HR. Can you do 60 slides in five minutes, 15 seconds a slide, go. And all of a sudden, somebody's done their five-minute thing. Oh, they're out of breath. It's like running a mile. Oh, I did it. Oh, I am so frustrated. That's the idea. But what I'm interested in is the impact. And I really hope, and, and you reinforced that so beautifully. So thank you for the uh, privilege of talking to you about those issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Thank you so much. And thank you for the work that you've been doing for so many years and helping people in HR to keep up with all the new things that we should know and uh, all the stuff that is ahead of us still. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave Aldrich, for this conversation. Your ideas certainly had an impact on the way I think about culture and the way I approach culture evolution when working with my clients. Thank you to all our listeners for tuning in. Thank you to our sound producer, James Eid of Be Heard, our production manager, Lindsay Nunes, content editor, Rachel Nice, and art director, Emily Spencer. Thank you, Peter Swanson, for reviewing the podcast on Facebook. Peter said that Culture Lab is one of the best sources of contemporary information about culture change out there. We're honored. Thank you so much, Peter. If you like Culture Lab, I would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review the podcast on iTunes. It really helps us to get the word out there and it enables listeners like you to find the podcast. By rating, reviewing and sharing with your network, you help us create the ripples that contribute to building awesome workplace cultures. And before we go, I have the preview of the next episode for you. This time, my guest is Aisha Bursell. Aisha is a designer and her work can be found in um, the permanent collections of the MoMA, Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum and Philadelphia Museum of Art. She's one of Fast Company's most creative people for 2017 and she's on the Thinkers 50 shortlist for talent. She writes a weekly post on innovation for Inc. And you know, I think that it would be too long to list all the rewards that Aisha received for her design, but her work is not limited to designing. She also helps organizations and individuals to use design thinking and design process to bring their own vision to life. Her book, Design the Life You Love, helped me to design the life I love. Um, in fact, um, that included taking a few really radical decisions like leaving the corporate world and striking out on my own into the world of entrepreneurship and creativity. I have to say, I love Aisha, I love her work, and I'm incredibly happy to introduce her to you as my guest in two weeks from now. Here is a short preview of our conversation. What I've found in applying design process to work and life is that most people think that they're not creative. And I've worked with thousands of people in helping them design their work and life using design process and tools. And what I've learned is actually ordinary people, and I call non-designers affectionately ordinary people, are extraordinarily creative and the missing piece that a lot of people don't use is having a process so um, to bring out the creativity in people and the problem solving qualities you need a process so um, and that's what we bring to corporations is this very simple step-by-step -step guidance Thank you for listening to this episode of Culture Lab. If you found any moments that were interesting, inspiring, or maybe even game-changing, please share it with someone who'd appreciate it. After all, good ideas are meant to be shared. <laughs>